I'm removing the waiting room now. People will join. Welcome, bienvenidos y bienvenidas, bienvenue. Este evento cuenta con interpretación en directo en español. Para elegir un canal de audio, haga clic en este botón y seleccione su idioma preferido. Cet événement dispose de una interpretación en direct en francés. Para choisir un canal audio, cliquez sur ce botón y seleccione la lengua de votre choix. This event has live interpretation in English. To choose an audio channel, click on this button and select your preferred language. Interpretation is not available if you are connecting using the Zoom web client and on some mobile phones. Please, when possible, use the desktop app. Here are a few important tips for this call. Since we are many people on this call, microphones will not be active. Nonetheless, for us it is vital to hear from you. To do so, we will use Slido to ask you questions or opinions throughout the virtual forum. Also, during question and answer segments, your questions will be collected via Slido. To access Slido, go to slido.com, preferably on your mobile phone, and enter in lowercase letters the event code CSSI2021. Go in now and ask your questions at any time during the session. Don't worry, we will share the information on how to access Slido again through the chat. You can also access the chat to talk with fellow attendees or request technical support. However, keep in mind that we will only take questions you share via Slido. Now, there are other ways to get yourself heard too. Until Friday, March 26, 
we will be conducting a collaborative diagnosis on systemic risk for the education sector in the Caribbean. To take part, you only have to access the online board where you can share your views of what makes up systemic risk in the education sector, what puts pressure on the system, where it tips over and what you suggest we must do about it. The board is available in English, French and Spanish through the links now being shared via the chat. Finally, we point out that all sessions will be recorded. Thank you for being here today and we hope you enjoy. Franklin D. Roosevelt once said, we cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. A pleasant good morning to the various heads of government departments, CDMA representatives, all our partners and colleagues, Mr. Moderator, panelists, presenters, and to you, the wider, the wider audience. Welcome to the youth session of the Virtual Caribbean Safe School Initiative, Pre-Ministerial Forum. My name is Miss Anna Lewis, outgoing CARICOM Youth Ambassador for the Commonwealth of Dominica and Programs Assistant at Israel Dominica. Today, I am here to, wel to graciously welcome you and to share with you my excitement and enthusiasm. The Caribbean Safe School Initiative held its first youth forum in Antigua and Barbuda in 2017 and its second in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2019. Throughout the region, safe school environments have always been one common voice. Safe schools in the context of climate resilience and youth empowerment to foster growth and positive development in young people across the region and the world. In Dominica, there are many NGOs and CSOs who have contributed significantly towards the Safe Schools Initiative. Israel Aid came to Dominica shores shortly after the devastating Hurricane Maria back in 2017, where they expressed great care. And I like to, I like to use care as compassionate assistance reaching everyone. Israel Aid teams came at a time when Dominica was most vulnerable. They restored happiness by rebuilding homes, schools, churches, and much more. They provided psychosocial support and training, and they also contributed significantly to providing safe spaces and schools across the world. Most recently, as we speak to schools, as we, as we seek to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, Israel Aid has provided significant amounts of support for schools and communities around the world. They have donated recreational kits to help engage students in psychosocial support, and they have also engaged persons in communities and within schools in trainings on safety and disaster risk reduction management, as well as providing schools with hygiene equipment to ensure safer school environments. There's so much more that I'd like to share with you, but today we are here to give our youth from across the region the opportunity to speak on the whole topic of school safety in the region. We have a very interesting and packed program for you, the audience today. And as I conclude on this welcome, I want to once again remind you that our united voice as it relates to safe schools in the region will not only blaze the trail for a generation that will be inspired to care, but it will also remind us that the youth of today of how much we play a pivotal role in the development and sustainable development and climate resilient society. Once again, welcome everyone to our Caribbean Safe School Initiative Youth Forum 2021. Thank you. Now I present to you Mr. Clive Murray, who will take the, who will do a presentation now. Um, he is the communication and education specialist in, with CEDIMA. Clive, let's welcome Clive.
Hi, Clive, you're, you're muted. Hi, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Marcel, you got, you got my message. <laughs> thank you, Anel, good morning, everyone. And um, adopting the protocols established so far, uh, pleasant good morning to everyone. And thank you very much for having me. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. Uh, Marcel, you could make me co-host, please. Thank you very much. All right. Um, once again, thank you very much for, for having me, for inviting me to speak at um, the youth session for the Caribbean CS School Initiative Pre-Ministerial Forum for 2021. Um, the topic that I was asked to speak on is there on your screen, the current opportunities and challenges of um, youth, youth governance and advocacy in a systemic risk uh, context. Just to give you a quick outline, um, I'll be speaking on the Caribbean's reality and looking at it within a systemic risk environment um, context, COVID-19 impacts um, specifically on the youth, uh, looking a little bit on youth governance and advocacy in the Caribbean and outlining a few challenges and opportunities for going forward. So with regards to the Caribbean's reality, um, well, let's examine the vulnerability of the Caribbean a bit more specifically. It has been considered the second most disaster prone region in the world. Um, the most immediate cause is our exposure to many natural phenomena of geological, atmospheric, hydrogeologic, seismic, and volcanic origin, which constitute hazards. In addition to physical characteristics, such as um, our hazard exposure, our vulnerability is linked more to intangible factors, such as land use planning, how we make decisions, and institutional weaknesses. Some of the causal factors of Caribbean vulnerability may be said to be a high degree of exposure to a range of natural and anthropogenic hazards, fragile ecosystems of a link to social and economic development, corals, well, for example, corals, seagrass beds, fishing grounds, salt ponds, uh, forests, wetlands, rivers, etc. And of course, heavy concentration of settlements and populations in low line and or coastal areas and other hazard prone locations. Um, for example, um, populations or settlement, settlements built adjacent to an active volcano. Then we have the issue of poverty and of course, climate change. And all these, re all these experiences that we have in the region, we are, our vulnerability. Um, um, amplify the systemic risk environment that we have, that we currently face. Now that's a dashboard that was taken from the CARICOM website, that's the CARICOM COVID-19 dashboard. It gives an overview of our status of the confirmed COVID-19 cases that we have throughout the CARICOM region and um, highlighting, of course, the deaths, recoveries and active cases. So this gives a snapshot of where we are um, I think the numbers would have been updated by today, um, but this is the recent information that they have on their website, which shows that we are, um, you know, we do have a serious case of COVID-19 um, with the pandemic affecting us in the region. So in terms of systemic risk and its environment and uh, how the Caribbean falls into that, the I try to get two definitions, or at least a couple of de definitions um, to highlight what systemic risk is all about. The first definition occurs when a hazard uh, will not only lead to negative effects in parts of the system, but also 
to failure of the system as a whole. And uh, the other definition is where uh, systemic risk becomes, where risk becomes systemic when a society's essential systems, example, telecommunications, infrastructures, healthcare, are potentially threatened. And the source for these definitions um, was taken from a paper on governance of systemic risk for disaster prevention and mitigation, which was, um, which was a, a contribution to the 2019 edition of the Global Assessment Report on Disaster Risk Reduction. But as we can see, or as we can deduce from the definitions, in our context, natural hazards often trigger chain reactions that lead to a long sequence of technical and societal damages with disastrous outcomes. Uh, Sedema concurs with the UN Global Assessment Report on Disaster Risk Reduction that the traditional understanding of risk events as distinct from each other has given way to the reality that the world is subject to a system of risk elements that constantly interact and build up unfold and manifest as the world's most visible disaster events. That is, very, that is the very definition of, of, of systemic risk. And Sedema, through its harmonized multi-sectoral governance mechanism, has long adopted what the Global Assessment Report refers to as a network perspective to risk governance needed to effectively counter systemic risk. Sedema's guiding CDM strategy considers all hazards all phases, all sectors, all institutions, and all levels. Now the systemic risk environment in terms of um, climate change, and as you can see from that, um, that photograph there, climate change is increasingly being seen as a COVID-19 patient. So if ever there was a moment in time uh, which reinforces that we live with systemic risk, it is now. While amid a prolonged COVID-19 pandemic, the existential threat of climate change persists. There's an ongoing effusive eruption of the La Sofere volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and early forecasts reveal that we might be in for an, another active Atlantic hurricane season. So we can't let our guards down on the issues of climate change. We are operating in a multi-hazard environment, which brings a lot of challenges. However, despite the systemic impacts of COVID-19, our Caribbean nations have demonstrated resilience, innovation, and agility in finding opportunity amidst the challenges. Now, this, this diagram, this photograph, um, is taken from the Global Assessments, Global, Global Risk Report, sorry, for 2020 from the World Economic Forum, and it shows the top 10 risk over the next 10 years, um, looking at the long-term risk outlook. Um, with the likelihood of the long-term risk outlook for us. And as you can see, most of the green areas are related to the environment. They are environmental, um, extreme weather, climate action failure, natural disaster, biodiversity loss, um, human and human-made environmental disasters. So these are what, in terms of what the outlook um, for the next 10 years looks for us. You know, you, you see, we don't have a COVID-19 pandemic in there. So let's hope that, you know, we can get rid of this within the next year or two. Now, um, with regards to the COVID-19 impacts, uh, students are falling behind due to school closures and disruptions in education. Um, we understand, of course, that the digital divide exists and, you know, that result mainly in, in for, many poor households really who do not have the luxury of laptops or tablets or wi-fi connection um you know feeling the brunt of this this pandemic and the effects of it so what does this mean for education system and within the lens of our systemic risk environment and in our efforts to bring about transformational change in safe schools um, i'd like to reiterate four areas for consideration which were shared by our Executive Director Acting, Ms. Elizabeth Riley, last week in her opening address. The first is we need to anchor schools' resilience through the development of safe schools policies and the full integration of safe schools within the programs of ministries of education. For example, dedicated safe schools focal points must become the norm, linking safe school policies to the country work programming process coordinated by the natural, na, na, National Disaster Offices, sorry, 
connects the sector to the national resilience agenda and resource mobilization opportunities. Secondly, develop strategies to adequately resource the Safe Schools program, a combination of national level budget allocations and leveraging external financing options such as the Green Climate Fund is suggested. An economic study that makes a case for investment in education sector resilience was commissioned by the Safe Schools Working Group through the kind funding support of the UNDRR. Third, explicit inclusion of digital transformation within the Mother Safe School program and the Caribbean Safe School Initiative roadmap is a must. And fourth and finally, we need to strengthen the ability to monitor and report on progress. So we believe that having these structures and systems in place um, will allow us to achieve the sort of transformational change we want to see throughout our education sector. In terms of unemployment, and um, this, as we know, was hard hit as a result of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, especially in the Caribbean. And I um, just want to share with you some result of a study, well, the 2020 annual labor overview that was conducted by the International Labor Organization, the ILO for Latin America and the Caribbean. And they register a strong increase in the unemployment rate that rose to 2.5 percentage points compared to the previous year, going from 8.1% to 10.6%. So the ILO report also stated that in 2021, the unemployment rate could rise again to 11.2%. Considering factors such as moderate economic growth of around 3.5%, which is insufficient to recover the lost ground caused by the crisis. There is also uncertainty surrounding the future of the COVID-19 pandemic, including fears about outbreaks and the effectiveness of vaccination processes. As it relates to the youth, specifically persons between 15 and 24 years old during the first three quarters of 2020, youth participation and employment rates fell by around 5.5 percentage points, reaching 42.7% and 33.0%. The youth unemployment rate rose 2.7 percentage points up to 23.2%, a level that had not been recorded before. And which, which implies that one in four young people was unemployed as of the third quarter of 2020. The report further highlighted that contraction in employment was particularly significant in the service sector, such as hotels, which recorded a negative point, negative 17.6 percent, and commerce, which recorded a, a negative 12.0 percent. So, on the other hand, it is also observed that the health crisis strongly affected employment in other areas and industries, including construction. Um, smallest drop in employment was was observed in in agriculture. So as, as you can see, the, the crisis, the pandemic crisis has um, severely impacted um, employment overall generally in the economy, but specifically as it relates, relates to the youth, um, at least one in four has lost that, their employment opportunity as a result of the pandemic. Now there are increased instances of depression and mental health issues. We look at the psychosocial um, um, situation with regards to young people and generally overall with everyone. Um, and we can see that also playing out in various different ways in our countries. But uh, this is something that we need to pay close attention to um, our mental health um, situation in the Caribbean. Now, with regards to youth governance and advocacy, um, as you can see, young people are in a position to manage their own affairs and address issues that affect them. We know that from um, their participation and involvement in a number of uh, bodies, uh, governance bodies and in, um, initiatives, as well as their advocacy around issues, including climate change and disaster risk, disaster risk reduction. So we are not starting from scratch. A number of governance issues exist for young people to be a part of and to make their voices heard. Some of the challenges, Involvement in the decision-making process. Um, this is where you know there's a systemic challenge with youth governance. Participation in the agenda setting or development planning process. We find that um, you know the youth, they, 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 
they can coordinate among themselves and they can you know um, advocate on issues but um, in terms of having a table having a seat at the table where a decision is is being made you you don't really find them there so um, you know that's that's one of the challenges that you know the youth pretty much highlight um, always the interest among youth in advocating on major sustainable development issues um, climate change disaster reduction resilient building recovery and so forth uh, there are some young persons who are interested in advocating on these issues, but um, of course, you know, would like far more persons to be involved. Importance placed on the inclusion of climate change and disaster risk reduction issues in education and school curriculum. I think this is something that we've been hearing about throughout the forum and, um, you know, how how best we can actually push this 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 aspect forward uh, to ensure that our curriculum is you know um, include the 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 sort of um, information and education regarding to climate change and disaster risk reduction and finally the awareness and education among some educators and parents on youth initiatives and programs now i think we need to increase that level of awareness and education among those particular target audiences so that they are aware and they can also um, provide support to the young people in their uh, advocacy efforts. So what are some of the opportunities? Um, youth are an untapped resource for disaster risk management. And here at CDMA, we recognize the youth's potential to impact change. Um, we see youth bringing unique knowledge and skills to the table, including their intrinsic understanding of the use of new media, social media in particular, um, supporting youth capacity building to be able to effectively meet their potential as agents for driving the resilience agenda. So we see um, quite a few opportunities exist uh, at the regional, at the national, regional, international level for youth to improve on their governance and advocacy initiatives. Um, the, the, the CDMA's Youth in Comprehensive Disaster Management Program, its general aim at the Caribbean conferences, we have um, every two years, we host the Caribbean Conference on Comprehensive Disaster Management and we give youth an opportunity, youth delegates to participate um, in, in, in this forum um, to engage with the political, socioeconomic, scientific and cultural aspects of disaster management. The sessions that we host seek to provide an, an avenue for young people to expand their knowledge in the area of disaster management, climate change, and the environment. Um, so here we go. You know, we want to encourage you and others, you know, youth and, and, and others to, um, you know, engage with our own Caribbean youth climate community, um, um, communication as well. Um, the, we have, for example, uh, Russell from Dominica. It was a UNICEF project uh, as a reporter, and um, he would have, you know, produced something on the voices for the youth in Dominica relating to the impact from uh, Hurricane Maria um, back in 2017. So um, that's it from me. Thank you, and keep safe. Okay, thank you, Clive, for your comprehensive presentation on uh, the current opportunities and challenges of Caribbean governance, of Caribbean youth governance and advocacy um, in a systematic risk context. Um, so thanks, thanks so much, Clive, for your presentation. Um, let me take this opportunity now to introduce to you Mr. Firelander, who will be um, or who will be moderating the roundtable discussion. Um, Mr. Lander serves as the first vice president of the National Youth Council um, of Dominica and professionally works as a student nurse. Fayel was also a participant of the 2019 um, youth session, which was held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And now today he's back here with us, but in capacity as the moderator. Um, so, FILE continues to give off selflessly to volunteerism in Dominica, and so we are very happy that he is going to moderate the session today. 
So with no further ado, I welcome Mr. File Lander. Good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here at this amazing initiative at this free ministerial forum that is all aimed at hearing what the youth have to say with regards to the Caribbean Safer School Initiative. And basically youth across the region have over the years displayed their resilience and displayed resilience to its core. Youth movements such as the National Student Councils, National Youth Councils, Youth Parliaments, CARICOM Youth Ambassadors, and other youth advocacy movements across the region have embarked on many campaigns to advocate for breakthroughs in climate change, policy making, gender equality and equity, education, and a host of other pertinent issues across the Caribbean region that are affecting them. Young people have been agents for change, bringing forward ideas and initiatives that not only showcases the building of a resilient island, but seeks to build a resilient Caribbean region, which is all very, very amazing, I must say. And this morning, I am joined by four amazing youth from across the island. We have four amazing young panelists, young leaders, young ambassadors for Caribbean Safer School Initiatives. And in the interest of me not um, butchering their last name, first or last names, I'm going to invite them one at a time to int introduce themselves and take us into the beginning of this very important round table discussion. Very often we have the, we tend to plan for the youth but not with the youth. And Sadima and Israel and the other organizations have made it very clear that we are planning with the youth and not for the youth. And it's, I'm very grateful to be a part of this initiative and being having been asked to serve as moderator for this discussion. So we're gonna go right across to our first panelists who will say who they are, where they're from, and what, why exactly they are here today. So go right ahead to the first panelist. Good morning, everyone. Hope all is well. I would first like to thank CSSI for including me in this insightful panel today. I'm very excited to be a part of this discussion. My name is Priyanka Lala. I'm 14 years old and was born and raised here in Trinidad and Tobago. My love for the environment gave me the passion to protect it and led me to where I am today. I first started 10 years ago um, where I started to promote the idea of a zero waste lunch kit in my cafeteria at school to starting my own blog where I taught other young people and children in my community to live with the mission of a zero waste life with one day a hope of creating a circular economy. I then became a child rights ambassador where I worked with the office of the prime minister in Trinidad and Tobago and UNICEF. I continued to advocate for the environment and the rights of the child for three years where I took charge in leading discussions, raising awareness and creating positive change in my country. In 2020, I became the first ever UNICEF Youth Advocate for the Eastern Caribbean and my work as an advocate looks at creating a better, brighter Caribbean future for all young people. I'm very grateful to be a part of this discussion today where I can empower the voice of children throughout the region by continuing to contribute to the right to an education and the right to a safe environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Priyanka, and looking forward to your contribution to this morning's discussion. So we're gonna move right across to our next presenter. Go right ahead. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Brendan Taylor. I'm 25 years old. I am from Barbados and um, I have served as a member of the CDMA Youth in CDM Steering Committee. Um, as was mentioned, I also would have participated in the forum in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2019 uh, as part of the Youth Forum as a precursor to the Ministerial Forum. Uh, and when given the opportunity to participate in today's forum, I grabbed the opportunity with both hands um, 
with the opportunity to basically or the, or the, the vision to continue to participate or continue to contribute to the work of the CF school program. In terms of my professional uh, career, all of my work so far has been targeted to contributing to the existing work on climate change and climate resilience through the lens of natural resource management, as well as disaster risk reduction. Um, this builds on a background of having a master's of science in natural resource management uh, with a specialization in water resources management, as well as a bachelor's in geography and um, environmental and natural resource management. Uh, so far, I have contributed to several projects, including the development of a concept note to the Green Climate Fund for the Clear Water Project, which was aimed at building climate resilience in three water sectors across the Caribbean. Um, and as I said, my work has also contributed to disaster risk reduction through uh, consultancies at the Sedima. So I see some persons as well. I feel at home here. I see some persons I would have met in St. Vincent. So I'm just happy to be here and excited for the discussion to come. Thank you, Brennan. I too have been noticing some names coming from St. Vincent and even from before, um, Brendan and I have been basically following each other across the region over the past few years um, as it relates to this entire CDM, CSSI initiatives. And it is, and I, I must say that Brendan is very passionate about the topic and definitely I look forward to his contribution. Um, let's go right along to our next presenter who I believe is coming from my home island, Dominica, Miss Angeline Dover. Good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Angeline Dover. I attend the Dominica State College. I'm currently in my second year as a building and civil engineering major. And I'm very much, I very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in this forum, in this panel discussion. I represent my student ambassador club at my school. I signed up for there. And I am just excited. I, although I haven't been through all the CDMA and direct con, directly contributed before in terms of actions or whatever I might have, but not directly for the city man, all these other clubs, um, organizations, I'm happy to have the opportunity to voice my opinion on our, on all these youth-based issues and voice my opinion on how we can, youth can aid in developing our Caribbean and the climate resilience, everything, like how we can contribute, I would like to. I'm happy to be a voice for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angeline. I'm looking forward to your contribution as well. And uh, fear not, I'm sure that we are all here going to support you as best as we can. And it's not about your experience, but what you can actually contribute in your own individual capacity, because all of us are entering here with globally, and I, I'm, I think you should find yourself rest assured that even ministers at the highest level um, in, in their governments have found difficulty with wrapping their minds around the whole concept of um, comprehensive disaster management and um, Caribbean safest, the Caribbean Safer School Initiative because it is not, it's no easy feat. And we will be discussing more about that. So in a, in a short, of course, before we get into that discussion, we cannot forget our final panelists. Um, last, but definitely by no means least, Mr. Adele Pierre. I do hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. And we're just going to invite you to introduce yourself this morning before we get into the meat of things. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. And and I'm very excited to be part of, uh, uh, as a panelist at this um, initiative. So uh, my name is Adlin Pierre and I'm from Haiti. And uh, I, I currently have a bachelor degree in geography, environment, and special planning from the campus on of Limonade. 
So um, currently, I'm the um, disaster risk reduction regional focal point for the Americas at uh, United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. So I'm really excited, as I said before, to, to, to part of this session. So to discuss more about disaster risk reduction and the region, because as you know, the origin is very vulnerable about uh, uh, climate change, about disaster. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to exchange with you guys. And yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Adelel. I am sure that you too will be contributing to the best of your ability on the questions and topics that we are about to discuss. I would just like to, at this point in time, invite all of our representatives here throughout the Caribbean region, wherever you may be, uh, that if you would like to interact with us, you can of course go on to slido.com and enter the code, which is CSSI. 2021 and of course you will be free to interact with us of course right now you're seeing on the screen the qr code if you have the ability to do so feel free to scan there and come across and join the discussion um at this point in time we will not be taking questions from the public we'll be going throughout the discussion and at some point in time later on of course we will allow for discussion points, but of course, if the, if the uh, conversation is getting to a point where we wanna hear what the, what the public is saying, we will of course open up the floor to your opinions, but we're not at that stage just yet. Let's go right along. Just want to let you all know that we of course have, before this session, um, put out to the public, uh, the, to, to a few key youth across the region to send in their videos, discussing about how does leadership and climate re resilience contribute to safer schools. So we of course have received four videos and during the course of the discussion, we'll take a few breaks to hear from our regional counterparts from a few of our islands across the region that will share their individual uh, contributions and opinions on that question. But before we move, before we get to there, we have our first question. Are we ready, guys? Let's just see a thumbs up. Are we excited and ready to discuss? Yes. Yes, I'm loving, I'm loving to see the smiling faces and I'm excited just as much as you are. So our first question is, can you share examples of how COVID-19 combined with the hurricane season impacted your activism? Uh, allow me to repeat the question. Can you share examples of how COVID-19 combined with the hurricane season impacted your activism? I think I would, for the interest of, let's not wait so long and, and we don't want much dead air. I'm gonna go across and uh, in a sense, pick on my, my regional counterpart, Brendan, to start off the discussion, if he does not mind. <laughs> No problem. Uh, I think that there, there'll be more focus on, I don't want to preempt anybody, but I think there'll be more focus on the impact of COVID-19. Uh, just because despite the, 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 the huge amount of activity that we saw from the uh, 2020 Atlanta hurricane season, to some extent, the, the Eastern Caribbean was not as uh, heavily impacted as our neighbors in those Central and Latin American countries. Uh, so we, we give God thanks for that. Um, we pray for the recovery. But in a sense, the, the COVID-19 pandemic or the crisis, whatever you want to call it, had a greater impact. And evidence of that is even as we, we were here today virtually. I believe that uh, under quote unquote normal circumstances, we possibly would have been maybe face-to-face, -face, um, engaging each other even beyond the forum uh, on a personal level, just getting to know each other and having that, that, that um, in a sense, fellowship, right? Um, so we, we have evidence of how on a formal level, COVID-19 has basically relegated us to the online platforms. Uh, we're, we're still thankful that we can meet, but beyond that as well, I think that fear, the fear of contracting uh, the virus and also the fear of how it would impact 
on our families as well has dented the, 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 the activism as usual as we would see it. And for me, I had to make decisions based on that. So you could imagine that things like, you know, environmental protection initiatives, beach cleanups, you, you want to go, but you are conscious of the fact that you going and possibly make, maybe, because you don't know, maybe contracting the virus, bringing it back home, and you have parents who are uh, in a vulnerable age group, you have um, maybe babies around your hall, in, in your household, sorry, around your house, in your household, um, who, who you don't want to see them contract the virus. You don't want to see them, even if they're in, asymptomatic, even if they are they recover in the two week period, you don't want to risk it, right? And I think that has, the, the, the fear has gripped young people as well from, especially those who are conscious of the fact that it doesn't just impact on their lives, but the lives of those who they love um, has hampered their, their ability to participate in those sort of activities. Indeed, uh, I, I, I too have found myself with that, that difficulty, um, for, found myself with that difficulty at the beginning of everything because of the uncertainty and the frustration across the board. Um, and, and of course, working in the health field, I'm sure you can well imagine that it was of a greater concern to me because I'm actually directly involved with the public. So it then put me in a sort of a on the fence type of way. But let me hear fr more from, from you guys. What, what um, if any of you can share examples of how COVID-19 um, combined with the hurricane season, though, um, though as inactive as it may have been in our parts of the world uh, region, um, how did that affect your uh, uh, activism? So let's hear from someone else. So um, I can go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just wanna add something um, related to what uh, Wyndon said. Uh, so as you may know, Haiti is not, uh, I mean, affected by um, COVID-19. And even though we, we are facing a lot of uh, challenges related to, you know, uh, get funding. And because of that, um, the government as well, you know, because of the, um, the restriction, so we can organize and personal activities you know, to bring people together to share knowledge and you know to 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 allow them to have access information so um it's really difficult for us uh, actually to to organize events so we have to postpone activities for the for for example to 2022 and and also we, the government as well don't have the plan as well to to get the vaccine actually so it's really difficult but we try to organize some like um, online event, even though we are facing uh, the, the internet issues. So it's really complicated here. So what is, yeah, it's kind of uh, like stressful activities, but we want to make sure that um, yeah, to continue to uh, act in our community and to, to facilitate young people to have access to information and, you know, to um, like uh, make sure that the, they raise their voice at, 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 at local and national level. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And we have just enough time to get um, just one more response on this question before we move, we move across to the next question. So um, does any one of the ladies feel like they wanna tackle this question or would they like to defer <laughs> to the next one? Um, I can answer if that's okay. Sure. Um, so in Trinidad and Tobago, we weren't necessarily affected by the hurricane season in 2020, and I hope we will not be affected in 2021. However, COVID-19 has changed the way that we communicate as the lockdown and the online school has kept me away from my friends and teachers at school and other people that I meet in day-to-day -day life. So it's definitely changed um, the way of life. And I've been using Instagram for my advocacy and my activism on climate change and on child rights for the last few years. And this was my main platform and it still is my main platform. So therefore, 
COVID-19 has not affected how I communicate personally in the three areas that form a significant part of my child rights advocacy and activism, which are the right to education, the right to protection, and the right to health, including mental health. So my climate change focus has been on my blog, and this is also online. I'm however constricted to the protocols of COVID-19 as I cannot visit schools or meet others physically who share the same, similar interests as me in advocating for a better education for all the children, including children with disabilities, for protection and safety of children in schools, in particular protection from bullying. And I've not been able to physically connect with others on advocating against non-communicable diseases. I know that I have a different impact when I can meet other young people as well as adults in person and we can have lively discussions in a way that we can't achieve when we're relaxed as we're on Zoom or Google Meets. And I used to, I used to visit schools and distribute anti-bullying posters and this is no longer possible. It was always exciting and encouraging to meet other young people like myself who share the same and similar concerns. So definitely the period of COVID-19 has affected our way of learning, our way of life, and just how we go through our daily um, life and how we work and how we go to school as well. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Of course, I, I can well imagine how, um, and it's, it's across the board for anyone who is an activist, it's very difficult and very impersonal in a sense, as, as, as much as you try to be as, vibrant and engaging as you as you can through the through the zoom platform or or google meets or any of the other um online platforms where discussions can be had um it's it's very difficult for you to really get to that interpersonal type of of engagement that you get from being face to face feeling touching in engaging the young people because at the end of the day it, it's very difficult um, to get a message across if someone cannot see the, yes, they're seeing it, but it's, it's something, it has a different feel, getting that engagement and actually seeing on the ground what the young people are going through, what the young people are being engaged in, what the young people are being affected by, then that can be limited in a sense if you do not have that engagement um so to say but of course um we here uh across the island are not isolated we are believed to be together through many organizations and of course the caribbean safer school initiative has brought us together uh through this platform and we have to make the most out of it and of course serve as our own individual ambassadors in our individual islands and across the board to identify how exactly we as young leaders, young motivators, young innovators, young uh, influencers, how we can individually promote the initiatives, this initiative, as well as other positive initiatives in our individual islands. So, um, but we can talk about ourselves, but there are, of course, other young people across the island, and we must highlight, I, I, I feel it would be remiss of us if we do not highlight the strong and impactful work that has been coming from our youth leaders and youth, uh, youth, youth ambassadors across the region. And we go now to the Bahamas, where Heather Brockbank, who had, who in who is an ambassador in her own right at her school, where she will tell us more about how she and other members of her school have, have of course, engaged themselves despite the effects of hurricanes and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. So of course, stay tuned if, if you would like to engage any one of us or engage the panelists here, you are, you are free to do so through the Slido platform at slido.com. Of course, you can enter the code CSSI2021. So let's go across to Heather Brockbank from the Bahamas.
good day. I am Heather Brockbank, an Eco School Committee member at Bishop Michael Eldon High School on Freeport, Grand Bahama, Bahamas. We support climate resilience by using alternate energy sources, such as solar power, to reduce our carbon footprint. To power everyday activities, such as lights and fans, solar panels were installed on both primary and secondary campuses. Furthermore, we also acknowledge power down Wednesdays and power down any time we are not using the lights or fans in the classrooms. We also utilize our rainwater catchment system that uses rainwater to water the plant in our school garden. In our garden, we grow beets, carrots, tomatoes, and all sorts of vegetables. This semester, we will expand and grow vegetables utilizing the aquaponic system that we utilize fish waste to fertilize lettuce plants and furthermore after we were hit with Hurricane Dorian it was hard to have fresh water to source for our garden. So the rainwater catchment system uses the aquaponic system and would also help with providing nutrients needed for the garden. We had to shift gears within the eco committee after the COVID-19 pandemic started. With the pandemic, we used the Zoom platform in order to hold our meetings. There have been disadvantages and advantages. In some areas where we were not allowed to have an open discussion and persons were discouraged to talk, we've utilized this time to invite more guest speakers to talk about the climate change and the environment in all areas from bird watching to corals to solar energy. Bishop Michael Eldon School continues to learn about the many aspects of climate resilience and looks forward to impacting our community of Freeport, Grand Bahama. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather Brockbank out of the Bahamas and congrats you and all of your colleagues at your school um, on an amazing initiative that you all have engaged in. I think it is admirable that in the midst of despair and where it may, may have seemed that there was no light at the end of this tunnel that you created your own light. And I think that is admirable and you must be applaud you and your school and your colleagues, the principal, the who are who are influential and instrumental in this uh, should have should be uh, commended for your work. Of course, we're going to move right along. So our next question uh, in the interest of time. And I think that this one, I think Angeline will be able to respond to because I, I know for sure here in the here in Dominica, we had our own bit of a difficulty um, and had to resort to online learning, especially at the Dominica State College. So we're gonna start off with Angeline for this question. And of course, anyone else who feels that they want to tackle this one, you are free to do so. So Angeline, um, what recommendations do you have to promote student engagement in remote learning? What recommendations do you have to promote student engagement in remote learning? Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, personally, from my point of view, having been a student who had to do the whole online thing when our country was suddenly shut down, well, for schools, for sure, were shut down from March 22nd last year. It was kind of a, it was kind of a hit because we weren't too accustomed of bringing school at home so much. I mean, we always had homework, but this time we had to be learning literally learning at school when before we were accustomed of hearing from the teacher in a class setting, learning from the teacher and probably doing slight reinforcement at home, but having that background, having learned something in class. So as we had to do everything online, like learn everything from teachers, well, personally for my major, my teacher didn't do so much of teaching online. Before the semester kind of like took that crash, from when school closed, closed down and we had to revert to online. We did a lot of work. So for me, during that period of time, after lockdown, uh, when we started the lockdown, we were more doing assignments for my major. We were more doing assignments and tests. It wasn't too much of learning, but 
from hearing my other friends and seeing my little brother going through the whole online stuff, it I it did pose a challenge to get us considerably thinking about it. We we had the mentality, we go to school, we learn there with our teachers, and we comfortably in a class setting, we go to school to learn. And then at home, it's much, it's much more free up. So with that whole lockdown, everything, like our mindset was vacation because we were home and that's what you associate home with. You, you associate home with relax a bit. So it was kind of like a hard lash trying to, trying to balance home and school at home. So I could notice is this for my little brother because for me, well, I've always wanted to do well. So I was getting my assignments done, but it was still taking a toll on me because I don't necessarily have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning. But if I have an assignment due, I still have to drag myself, literally drag, because my mindset is that I'm at home. So for my little brother, I also saw him struggling to pay attention in class because that really wasn't what we were accustomed to. So a suggestion I would have to probably help in the remote learning of um, students in general is probably make the setting on Zoom because that's, that's the platform most schools use. Probably make the setting on Zoom really structured for, but not for so much time because at the end of the day, they're really at home, but you try and you kind of have to try to make a balance between school and home. You cannot have them feeling like they're at home while you're trying to teach them because their our attention wouldn't be so it it just wouldn't work as well. So my suggestion for that is have shorter classes but more structured classes on Zoom. So it's like it could have the days where we have fun, like the days that encourage students, oh my God, like that's what we're doing today. So I want to go to class, but still don't make them feel so much um, burdened because they're already in a setting, a relaxed setting. So we, as much as we have to try to encourage them to come to class, we have to make it as if when they come to class, they are actually in school. Like they have to sit up and they have to participate and whatnot for just a structured amount of time, but not too much time at, at one time because you have to take into consideration. They just, they probably don't feel it as much, but just to maintain, as much structure as we could, we should have, we should have, what we could have done was when that lockdown started or before, just before the lockdown started, put a plan in place to say, okay, we're going to start the lockdown on the 23rd. From the 23rd, we're going to start introducing the Zoom classes. What oh, most of our mistakes, like kind of the school mistake was, they gave us a break in between, like trying to figure out everything. So it's like everybody got like laid back and whatnot. So what could have been done was that we introduced it slightly as the lockdown began. So we don't get too much of a laid back attitude. And then we can try kind of keep up with regular life. Like not, not so much fall into the fact that we're not really at school, but we could get a feel of it gradually until like it become normal for us. Like not really normal, but just so we can better like, um, like we can better facilitate the online thing. Like we can take it in better. Yes. So I hope everybody understood. Yes, well, of course. I, I think you 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 definitely shared um a very salient point that it should be a sense there should within the change there should be a sense of normalcy that is, um enforced within the environment but while it's being enforced we must also identify ways in making the young people feel a bit more comfortable um, because this is taking them um, by that would have taken them by surprise I think moving forward should this become necessary once more um, we are definitely prepared um, in a sense that we can easily jump back to that um, environment. We know here in Dominica, we have returned um, to in-class instruction. I know, I mean, I'm not sure for the other Caribbean islands represented here, um, 
if that is the case. Um, Brendan, in Barbados, are you back in, um, in, in class instruction or it's still online? Still online. Um, I think they are making plans to return to the mm -hmm. schools for the third term of the okay. year. Uh, but I also want to echo some of the points that Angeline made um, in terms of time as well, because one of the things that they've they've done in Barbados, the Ministry sorry of Education has done, is to institute a policy where classes are um, they don't exceed uh, uh, 25 minutes or between 25 to 30 minutes, I should say, and it, and it really provides a, a a structure where you understand that you are in an online environment, even even my even myself as a older young adult, when we are in online meetings, we start to feel tired. Um, we start to feel uh, we start to get distracted. The reality is that we have phones, like Angela said, we're home. So something somebody pops into your space when you're at home and asks you a question, you miss maybe an important piece of information. So that's one of the recommendations that has been taken up. Um, I also want to say that having professionals who are in the educational system in my family, I've seen them take advantage of uh, the online environment and using the technology, taking advantage, advantage of the technology to implement things like online um, educational games, uh, which really capture the attention of the students, especially at the primary level. And the, the last recommendation I would suggest was that would be that where, it, where it's possible, I've seen that there's been more success in the attendance rates of students who have adult supervision available to them, who, who have um, persons who are there with them, coaching them along or making sure that they are paying attention and that they're, they're, they're doing. I, I understand that that is not possible in all situations, but where that is possible, I think that that is also something that should be should be done. Thank you so much to you, Brendan, and of course, Angeline. Um, you have you both have made um, very salient points with regards to the recommendations. I think also another key recommendation that should be echoed across the region is, um, especially for young people, or while we are enforcing the idea of uh, um, going online and, and learning online, we must also identify where the gaps exist. For example, um, we, there are some areas uh, we must recognize that maybe without internet access, um, how many young people may actually have access to a computer that can get online. So these are some areas in which we're I think there were a few gaps at the beginning. We've seen a, a lot of movement from where we were to where we are now. And of course that can, of course you, you there's no such thing as being perfect. And of course there's always room for improvement um, where, when it comes to the, the work of activism and involvement of youth, um, but we must definitely take, in, take into consideration these key, um, bits of information and of course listen to the young people's voice. It's a very strong voice that too often is silenced and we need to allow it to be heard across the region. I cannot echo this enough today um, because we, we have to be heard. Too often we try to silence our young people when they have voices and, and opinions or, or want to voice the opinions with regards to issues such as this. And I must commend um, the Caribbean Safer School Initiative, Sedima, Israel Aid, and of course, all the other partners who have come together to have this second pre-ministerial pre conference that we are and forum that we are having today, that is all aimed to get the voice of the youth to move into the next session that will be coming up, um, the ministerial conference that will be coming up shortly. So at this point in time, we're going to move right along into our next question because we are, of course, pressed for time. We cannot allow, uh, we have some very strong questions that are still to come. So of course, reminding all of you, if you still have not done so yet and you have questions for one of our panelists or myself, feel free to go ahead and send those questions 
to Slido. And of course, that is Slido, S-L-I-D-O.com. And of course, the code is CSSI2021. We're going to go right across, and that's, of course, on your screen right now. So our next question is, what kinds of participatory platforms do you recommend to strengthen the involvement of youth in taking responsibilities within the community and DRR action? This is a heavy one, so I'm going to repeat it just one more time. What kinds of participatory platforms do you recommend to strengthen the involvement of youth in taking responsibilities within the community and disaster risk, disaster risk reduction uh, um, actions. So let's go ahead. I think Priyanka, would you like to tackle this one first? Yes, thank you. Um, so thank you for this question. This is a critical issue and this discussion is timely. Children are the agents for change and they are the key stakeholders to the future and the resilience of our communities and our region. So children and children with disabilities must be included and must be given information and resources to help us understand the challenges of climate change as well as information on disaster preparedness. The future belongs to us and we have the ideas, we have imagined the world that we want to live in and forums such as the CSSI play a critical role in empowering children and young people to find their voices and to share their concerns and their solutions for the problems that they are facing and they need to confront in their environments. So technology plays a crucial and paramount role as it allows us to do our own research and find innovative solutions to address problems we see in communities. For instance, social media and apps can help us connect and to learn about climate change and how to reduce our carbon footprint or how we can keep ourselves and our environment safe and how to handle even subjects such as cyberbullying. Information is very important and it is our greatest asset. Not everyone has access to internet and uh, as we discussed before. So um, posters and workbooks and school assignments must be shared to communicate the issues that we, are, that we are facing so that every child out there has access to the information. And it's very important to our communities. And the, th these are the steps that must be taken in case of a disaster. And we in the Caribbean are affected by hurricanes and earthquakes. So children and young people rely on adults to educate us and support us in our efforts to share our voice and to harness our creativity, including children in discussions about planning, preparedness and rebuilding will ensure youth participation and collaboration. We have ideas and we would like to work with adults, work with leaders in society, mentors to secure our future and build resilient communities that would help us to flourish and realize our dreams. It is important that we have accurate information and we are protected while on social media as our efforts will go in vain. And I'm happy to announce that in my country, Trinidad and Tobago, we've set up a steering committee to a committee where I present the voice of the youth. I represent the concerns and I share ideas from other children and young people to ensure that our needs are addressed. So it's things like this, organizations like this, groups like this that need to empower the youth and give youth a voice because we are the agents for change and our voice needs to be heard. Definitely, I think that is a very salient point. And of course, before we continue this discussion, just to keep engaged with the regional community, of course, we go across to St. Thomas now to Summer Benjamin, as she um, will be indicating to us how exactly in her region she's contributing to the entire Caribbean Safer School initiative. Of course, reminding all of you that you can still remind to send in your questions through slido.com and the code is CSSI2021. So of course we go across to Summer Benjamin out of St. Thomas at this time. My name is Summer Benjamin, the pop youth ambassador for the Caribbean. I'm Antiguan American and I live on St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands. I'm a junior in high school, an ocean advocate, and a climate activist. 
Protecting the beautiful ocean has always been one of my passions. I'm here today to talk about how youth leadership and climate resilience contribute to safer schools. Schools are an integral part of any community, no matter where in the world you live. I started off my work for the environment with a project called Eco Leaders in California. This project helps restaurants reduce their single-use plastic usage. I am now working to bring this effort to the Caribbean. I've had the amazing opportunity to attend and present at numerous global events, including the World Sustainable Development Forum, the POP Festival, and KOI 15. At these events, I had the chance to share my views with global leaders, as well as other youth. This cross-generational collaboration has opened up many unexpected opportunities. Young people need to recognize that they have a voice in conversations about climate resilience and safer schools. We are the key stakeholders. It is our future that is at stake. There are so many things that young people can do to take action, such as participating in beach cleanups, reducing their own plastic consumption, and educating themselves about marine biodiversity. My specific focus is on ocean health and plastic pollution. Many believe that healthy oceans and human health are not related, but this is not true. They are intertwined. The COVID pandemic has had a profound effect on school life. Many schools are closed right now and students have to learn online. Our schools will have to significantly improve and alter safety and precautionary measures in order to reopen. On St. Thomas, only the private schools are open at this time. This means that the majority of youth on islands are learning remotely. It is critical that young people have a voice in the future about safety, considering it is our future. All Caribbean youth should engage in conversations with those in power and find ways to collaborate with government entities and global leaders. I urge our leadership to include these young people in policymaking and direct actions. We are ready. And thank you so much to you, Summer, out there in St. Thomas. And in the interest of time, we of course need to move on to the next question, which I'll be posting to posing, sorry, to Adela Pear. Um, however, Priyanka, thank you so much for your input. I think that you made a few salient points and definitely uh, would like to echo those those sentiments that you have shared here this morning and would like to congratulate you and your team in Trinidad for all the wonderful work that you've been doing thus far and would like to encourage you to continue to do so. So Adela, this question that we have for you is, what do you believe will happen if young people underplay their part in efforts to strengthen climate resilience? What do you believe will happen if young people underplay their part in efforts to strengthen climate resilience? Go right ahead, Adela. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I want to say that, uh, as you may know, that in the Caribbean, um, you want a two-third of the population are young people, so um, they are to like play a, a, a play um, a role in the effort, you know, to strengthen the climate resilience. So for me, um, the the I believe that. Uh, they can like uh, help the government like to achieve the goals related to climate change, related to you know to reduce the impact of um, disaster uh, risk, risk, and also that can help you know people to to as you may know people have a initiative they can have new ideas and new um, perspective to to help their community to 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 build. A, climate resilience and also they can also allow uh, to have uh, more action, the concrete action to fight against um, climate change. So this is all about, uh, yeah, this all. <laughs> Thank you, Adela, definitely. Um, if we as young people don't take, it, take this seriously, we won't have a world tomorrow to, to live in. Our children won't have a world tomorrow to live in. And that is something that we must take into consideration. And we must take 
our own responsibility because it's no one else. Uh, it's 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 our responsibility responsibility in our own little parts of the world and united together in our little parts of the world compared to the massive countries and, and, and global global communities that are contributing in their own regard, we must do our own um, contributory efforts. Of course, we go across to Barbados right now where Sean Cook will be talking to us all about his efforts in the Caribbean um, towards the entire idea of leadership and climate resilience contributing to safer schools. Let's go across to Sean Cook. Remind me, of course, to pose your questions on. Greetings, everyone. My name is Sean Cook. I am 32 years of age. I'm a wheelchair user, a director for the Barbados Council of the Disabled, an athlete for my country, wheelchair racing, among other things. I also just want to give a special thanks to the Caribbean Safe School Initiative for inviting me to speak on some important topics. And one of those topics are youth leadership. Why is youth leadership important? It's important because our younger generation are the leaders, are the future and enabling them to have a voice, educating them on the important needs of change, of good change is necessary. And I just want to encourage younger persons to speak, to use their platforms such as the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebook, and you can reach a wider audience by doing so, by expressing their wants, expressing their needs. And this starts at the school level. And that's why having safe schools, safe school environments is very important for our young people. And that's why having a lot of garbage, smelly, pungy environment is not only unhealthy, but it also digress our learning as younger persons. And that's why it's necessary that we not only take care of ourselves, but take care of our environment. And that's where we resign, that's where we learn. So climate change or the effects of the climate is also important. And just let me say it by saying this, that once you have a clean environment, the honest environment, you will learn better. You will have more fun. You will be able to go to the beach, don't worry about no seaweeds or go to school, don't worry about any pungent smells that may affect your, your health. And here at the Barbados Council for the Disabled, we do have the fully accessible program, the sensitivity training where we go to schools and we only teach about inclusion and how, how, how to interact with persons with disabilities. We also interact with younger people and we encourage them to have a voice to enable themselves to be better persons. And I know it's quite difficult right now because we're going through a pandemic, COVID-19, and no one expects this to happen at any time. But it also highlights to us how bad we were treating our environment. Just for example, there were a place in India that when the lockdown was established, the factories were shut down, less cars in the road. That was the first time that those individuals saw a clear sky in their region. And that is alarming because clean air leads to longer and better life. And COVID-19, as bad as it is, it shows us that our effects on our environment is something that we need to think about, we need to address. We're having warmer oceans due to the ozone layer and the effects of the ozone layer, which are resulting in stronger hurricanes. So we need to address these things. And as youth leaders, I think that we need to educate ourselves in these important aspects. And by closing, I just want to give my encouragement to younger persons to don't give up. Your voices are important to anyone else and to keep pushing and keep striving and use your willpower. Use what you have learned to change society for the better. Thank you.
Thank you, of course, to you, Sean Cook, out there in Barbados. Um, amazing work. I see Brendan is smiling because his countryman has come forward and shown how amazing, how amazing thing, such amazing things that they're doing in their regard. And I think that will lead us right into this next discussion that we want to have um, on this question. And I would love to pose this question to Brendan because I know he will be doing this one, this one justice. So, Brendan, tell me. How do you think governments can help in order to achieve safer schools? I remember you were very vocal on this topic back in St. Vincent. So this is why I've chosen to pose this one to you in particular. Let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, I, I want to also give a, a balanced response here um i think that i, I want to i want to start by saying that governments cannot do everything right um and it's even more so in an environment where really and truly there are cash traps the government does not any government does not um have its own funds it, it, it is dependent on its people uh, through raising taxes to, to have money to then manage that money to then allocate it to different to different areas. Uh, so we understand, we understand that. Uh, so we have to think, first of all, how can we, and I think Clive had mentioned it earlier in his presentation, how can we tap into those external um, external financial resources, whether it is grant funding, um, or yeah, I think we should go with that grant funding because loans mean they have to pay back. So how can we tap into those uh, those those financial resources to 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 push the idea or push the concept into reality of safer schools? And I think having having worked with Sadima, um, one of the things that Sadima has done is in is enter uh, an agreement with the government of Norway. And that has uh, that grant funded agreement has allowed uh, some work to start in St. Lucia, where schools have been either renovated in terms of their physical infrastructure or equipment has been supplied, equipment like fire extinguishers and such like has been supplied to those schools to allow them to be a safer environment. Now, on the flip side of what I just said, in terms of governments cannot do everything they can do something, right? And I think it comes with, government involvement comes with prioritizing safer schools as one of their top priorities. And I'll put it like this. We understand that our, our major economic or our major revenue earner is tourism. Tourism came to a standstill, right? During the year of 2020. And in the Barbadian context, what I saw happening was that, okay, we understood that tourism had been hit hard and other things just started coming up that I, I personally felt should have been prioritized before. Other things started coming up to the forefront now. So we're now seeing, oh, agriculture, tourism was hit, but agriculture still did its job. It still performed, it, it actually performed better than it did in, in previous years. And I know I'm seeing agriculture being prioritized and, and sustainable agricultural development being prioritized across numerous platforms. So what it means is that there is a space there or there's an opportunity for governments to prioritize safer schools. And then, as I said before, it does not necessarily need to be in terms of financial resources, but um, there's so many different players in this whole thing of safe schools. So on one hand, we have safer schools through improve physical infrastructure. But on the other hand, we have to tackle the social or the human element of what it means to be a safer school. And that looks like um, teachers who are trained in emergency scenarios. That looks like practicing drills, uh, emergency drills on a regular basis so students are not scrambling or they're not going through a panic when an emergency actually does take place. Right, so I think we need to prioritize those things. We need to have teachers who are trained to a, a, a level. And that's, I think, Fayel, you would agree with me, that is one of the things that we noticed when we actually did a site visit two years ago. We had instances where teachers were unsure of what to do in an emergency situation. 
we had instances where students had different ideas of where they should go or how they should react, right, in an emergency situation. That is a recipe for panic. That is not a safe school situation, right? So we need to prioritize those things and, and, and really combine the human element or the human component with the financial resources uh, to improve school infrastructure and equipment available. Definitely, Brendan. I think um, you touched on everything that I would have said um, with regards to this question. Um, we must definitely take into consideration the importance of how, um, and I think that you highlighted it very clearly that it's not only the responsibility of governments, it's each of our individual responsibilities as youth advocates, um, disaster management organizations, community disaster management organizations, and of course, um, regional funding agencies that do have the necessary resources that can be pumped into these islands, through the, through, into the schools, through the islands, um, to ensure that they are all prepped and ready to face any and every disaster. Of course, um, some things cannot be prevented, some things cannot be um, changed. Um, however, we have to do everything in our power to mitig mitigate, of course, those um, issues. Of course, we are running out of time. So at this point in time, I will go across to Lucien York out of St. Kitts and to give us a brief um, idea of what they're doing across in, their, uh, in his island. And of course, after that, we are going to take some questions from the public uh, to wrap up this roundtable discussion. Of course, thank you so much to all our panelists thus far who have contributed to the discussion. You have, you all were amazing. I wish we could be talking all day. Honestly, um, it um, inspires me every time I get an opportunity to speak with young leaders across the region. You all are amazing, 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 amazing. I cannot say it enough how amazing each of you are. Um, Brendan, you don't know, um, the Caribbean family always comes together in one way or the other to definitely work together to develop this initiative. And it's honestly an honor to be back here sharing the stage with you. So looking forward to more amazing things. But at this time, we're going to go across to Lucien. Hi, I'm Lucien York, a certified life coach and CDM Youth Ambassador and facilitator in matters related to comprehensive disaster management. This message is to all stakeholders of comprehensive disaster management, especially to all those of you who are here at this virtual Caribbean Safe School Initiative pre-ministerial forum. It is imperative that in these unprecedented times, that the various stakeholders with responsibility for comprehensive disaster management is trained and is up to date with all necessary information and trainings. The year 2020 and by extension 2021 has introduced to us its own crisis along with the everyday climate change crisis that we have been facing. This means an additional layer of issues, constraints and protocols for consideration and adaptation for our schools, our communities and the world at large. And so the question is, how does youth leadership and climate resilience contribute to safe schools? If every teacher, school staff, and student will make climate resilient their business and do just one thing to protect the environment, we will see the manifestation of safer schools. Two of the activities that the CDM Youth Ambassadors of St. Kitts and Nevis has done is to introduce school-based activities and community outreach conservation action to raise awareness on climate 
resilience. It is no doubt that COVID-19 has influenced climate resilience and safer schools within our communities and our countries, both positively and negatively. It has forced us to pay attention to our environment and at the same time has increased the amount of garbage on our landfills because of the additional mask and gloves and sanitization containers. I therefore endorse this virtual Caribbean Safer School Initiative pre-ministerial forum. Thank you so much to you, uh, Outer St. Kitts. You definitely, in your own regard, have been making your strides and contributions, Mr. York, and I want to congratulate you on that. So just before we're going to go across to the questions, I think Adele wanted to quickly give his input on one of the questions. So I want to invite you to go right ahead and do so uh, quickly, if you can do so in like 30 seconds, please, <laughs> so we can get into the question segment. Okay, thank you so much for, for, for this opportunity. I'm gonna quickly give an uh, answer about that. So as uh, Brendan mentioned before, that um, the government only can, you know, address, um, you know, the uh, issue, you know. So we have all civil society, all uh, people to work together. But I want to mention that we need to integrate so we need to government integrate the uh, uh, in school curriculum so we need to have a safe place you know where young people where children and youth and the caribbean can meaningful uh meaningful engage can learn can share experiences and innovate and take action you know to to fight again the problem related to the all uh, related to climate change. And we need also that government employment they should die framework by working, you know, with a ministry of education to make school infrastructure safer. So we need also that government like training trainings like teachers and principals to respond to a disaster or provide them equipment and, and tools to act when they need uh, yeah, so we need that a government create safe space for young people, and we need also work with government as well. So we need to, to include and in the decision making process related to disaster risk reduction related related to uh, climate change. So thank you. Thank you so much, Adele. And at this point in time, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists thus far for your amazing contributions uh, to the discussion this morning. We're gonna take a few questions from the public um, from Slido. Of course, uh, at this point in time, I invite any of you who have any last minute burning questions that you may have at this time, feel free to go to slido.com. Two zero two one eight two four. So now to the first question, and that can be pitched um, or tackled by any one of you. Um, in the interest of time, I think one per question will be sufficient. So, does I let's go ahead. Does DRR play a role in your experience of school, and how can? Sorry, I have to move this here. How can we as youth strengthen our commitment to to disaster risk reduction? So. Whichever one of you wants to tackle this one, go right ahead. Okay, um, uh, how about you, Priyanka? Do you feel like you can answer this one? <laughs> I think so. Um, so uh, this is a great question. And I definitely think that the strength in our commitment comes from our future and what we want to see in our country, our communities, and the change that needs to be given. And it's up to us because it is our future. And I think that 
there is no time like the present to take action and harness the creativity and the vibrancy of children and young people in the effort to adapt to climate change and to ensure that we are safe during natural disasters and disasters. And I definitely think that we need to work collectively with leaders in society, governments, mentors, parents, um, and just get the guidance that we need. And it needs to be a collective effort from both our adults and young people because you can't have that sense of connectivity and the strength without collaboration. And I definitely think that the efforts come from young people and adults. And I think that the strength will come from new innovative ideas and solutions and how we collaborate as youth and um, how we look at challenging ourselves and challenging the issues that are being faced and challenging our governments and um, cre being creative and using our voice for positive change. And I definitely think that working with authority figures will allow us to create a better, brighter future for each of us in the Caribbean. Uh, thank you so much to you, Priyanka. Unfortunately, we only have time and being prompted that we only have time for one more question. And we will allow that question to go up. And that is what types of psychosocial support would you have liked to receive to help you cope with the challenges of the pandemic and hurricane season? What types of psychosocial support would you have liked to receive to help you cope with the challenges challenges of the pandemic and hurricane season. Um, Angeline, would you like to answer this one? Okay, I can try, yeah. Um, the type of psychosocial support we have like to receive. Well, honestly, the pandemic was tough one, but well, in, Okay, I can talk about both because for most of us in the Caribbean and especially Dominica and a few other countries, we kind of on edge when we hear about the upcoming hurricane season because just recently it had brought so much destruction to our island with Hurricane Maria. So we kind of have a an old like an old feeling about it every time the hurricane season comes up because it could happen again. And in terms of just that, the hurricane season, I feel like in terms, especially for the young people, they should provide some sort of like, like forum to talk like a open, like during class, like they should provide classes, not classes itself, but provide people to various classes around these times to reassure students of, the measures we take in, in place of like protecting them, if in case something like Maria would happen again, because it was traumatizing for a lot of people. And like, there are people who are still afraid of rain. So it, it would just be important. It would have been, it could be nice if they would offer up therapies for especially students in around these times, because it, we know it's difficult for them. And with the COVID, the pandemic, it also posed like uh, another, like a similar kind of a par paranoia about it because everybody was scared. Indeed. Indeed, yeah. Everybody was scared with like, oh, I can't talk to anybody, I can't deal with anybody and whatnot. And you, you did, and in general, we didn't really know how to be okay with just each other just ourselves because we couldn't we could no longer socialize so much so it was like well, I mean, of people course, I know. Yes. Hmm? and of, i mean of course yes and and i think this would be a very timely point in the discussion for us to go across to our colleagues in the cayman islands who are going to present on their um, case study that they have been um, working on with regards from the Alex Panton Foundation with regards to psychosocial support, the youth and inclusion. Of course, before I, I do so, I'm just gonna go right across and thank all of you once more for your contribution th this morning. I think each of you have made a very significant contribution and have provided sufficient information that can be 
um, identified as the youth voice towards the upcoming um, ministerial conference. And of course, thank you all so much for your contributions. But we go right across to the Cayman Islands where Christine will be talking to us from the Alex Panton Foundation on Psychosocial Support, Youth and Inclusion. Thank you all so much. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can, Christy. Go, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just share my slideshow. Sure. Can you all see that? Yes, we can. Go right ahead, Christy. So we are the Youth Ambassadors, and we are part of the Alex Panton Foundation, which basically functions as a, as a support group slash mental health advocacy group for young people. And today we're here to talk about inclusion stories in Cayman. So what is inclusion? It is both a social practice, a practice and a part of policies that the government can create. And it's basically providing equal access to opportunities or resources for those who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. And this includes people with physical or mental disabilities as well as members of other minority groups. So you can see according to this diagram that exclusion is when no one is given, um, well only a certain group of people are given access to resources or opportunities. Segregation is when they are given a separate resource, oftentimes not at the same standard. Yeah, hello. Hello? Full terms, like free. Integration is then when they're included and they're allowed to use the same resources. And then inclusion is when they mingled and spread throughout. So the next speaker is Sadie Finch and she will be talking about disabilities. Thank you, Kristen. So to begin with, I would like to start with a little uh, personal story of a friend of mine. So my friend has a younger brother who has cerebral palsy and due to that has had a multitude of other health problems and has to be constantly in and out of the hospital. And it's quite a severe case. And that um, puts a lot of stress on their entire family. The mother had to quit her job and stay at home to take care care of the younger brother. And because of that, the father had to start working longer hours and got to see his family less and less. And for my friend, they were also forced to grow up faster because they had to take care of their younger brother. They had to understand that they wouldn't see their father as much because their younger brother had um, needed the extra attention from the mother, which is why she was no longer working as well. So one of the, some of the big problems on in Cayman for this is the idea that people believe that uh, including people with disabilities is something extra. It takes more effort. But one quote that's really stuck with me is that it's not extra, it's different. So it doesn't take extra energy or extra resources necessarily to include people with disabilities. It just takes looking at the situation in a different perspective. For example, using pictures instead of words to describe something or to demonstrate it. Um, so another major problem is visible and invisible disabilities. So a visible disability is one that you can see such as someone in a wheelchair and an invisible one is one that you can't tell that someone has just by looking at them. So in Cayman, um, people with visible disabilities even struggle to be included or even accepted into the community because one of the laws, for example, is that only government buildings are required by law to be wheelchair accessible. So this causes huge barriers for people with visible disabilities. They can't access a lot of buildings. They might not even be able to access their workplace. Um, so they have to find certain different places to work, different places to go to eat. They have to take this into consideration. And that's the people with the visible disabilities. The invisible disabilities is so much worse because people assume, um, I guess, that they have the same abilities as themselves. They assume ableism. And that is a dangerous assumption because the second somebody says, actually, I function better in a slightly different environment, they're labeled as different or not normal. And this is a really harmful for their mental health because they feel like they can't be a part of the general community and have to think twice before they go to certain places, such as the cafe, thinking, okay, will these people be able to like to serve me or 
Will the lights be too harsh if they have sensory problems? So these are all things that people have to take into account and it excludes them from the general society and community. So some solutions to these problems, the biggest one is education. Educating yourself and others on different types of disabilities and how it impacts different people. Because just because you see, for example, like two people have autism doesn't mean it presents itself in the exact same way between the two of them. So by educating yourself on the different ways that people um, deal with this or that people can experience these disabilities, it can help you become more accepting and include people into society. For example, create not parking on wheelchair ramps next to the wheelchair parkings, because that is something that is seen a lot. People automatically think it's a parking spot, but actually it's not. And another big one is person first and versus identity first language. So person first language puts the person's identity before their disability. It says that they are more than just their disability. Whereas identity first is saying that the person is just a part of their disability. For example, person with a disability is person first language, whereas a disabled person is identity first. So unless the person specifically tells you they are fine with identity first language, try to use person first language to show them that they are more important than their disability and that there is more to them than just their disability. Uh, next, um, Jadari Lemley will be talking about the LGBTQ community and inclusion of them. Thank you, Sadie. So before I get into my topic, I want you to think about this. So imagine, so what do you think about parents who disown, disown their kids, forcing them to be homeless? And what do you think about a society that makes a group vulnerable to being attacked, harassed, or even killed? I'll be talking about how the oppression of the LGBTQ plus community affects their mental health. So the reason why addressing this is very crucial is because they're more likely to develop a mental illness due to the negative view society has been placing on them for centuries, just because they're a part of the community. Now, this is not to, say that the label itself like being gay or trans causes the mental illness because that is false. It is the negative view placed onto them. And statistically speaking, you most certainly know someone who's part of the community, but because they don't have enough support, they don't share their story. And this in the Cayman Islands, the employment and housing discrimination or any discrimination at all for LGBT, LGBT people, there's no protection for them whatsoever. And the age of consent is still unequal 16 years for heterosexual, 18 years for homosexual. And they also have a two to six time chance of killing themselves. So just think about it, a two to six times chance of killing themselves because of what society has been doing to them. And sadly, I have a friend who has been open and honest about their identity to family and peers. And they've faced verbal and physical abuse from both parties from being called derogatory terms to being ganged upon. And really, no one should be treated like this, no matter what they believe in. And COVID hasn't made it any better because they further marginalize these communities by trapping them at homophobic and abusive family, jeopardizing their safety and well-being, which takes a toll on their mental health. And this also cuts off support of the community of people who do accept them, and that's even if anyone accepts them. Now to end on a good note, there are solutions that have been in place in Cayman, like Colors Cayman, Cayman LGBT Foundation, and the new focus group from Alex Panton, which focuses on creating a safe, inclusive space for the LGBT community while promoting education and encouraging dialogue. And it's nice to hear that these organizations are doing all this stuff, but the community also has to come in and help and they can, by, they can do it by just being kind to others, regardless of religion, race, sexuality, gender, or disabilities, and to watch your language, so not to use any slurs, and to not assume or stereotype people, but to educate yourself and to be gently curious. And the biggest one is to not out people. And if you don't know what that means, it's to expose someone of the community without their consent because it can put them in a very dangerous position. Like I listed earlier, they could be attacked, harassed, or even killed. And so I believe that schools should also bring more awareness, especially involving counselors and other executive staff members addressing these issues to maintain kindness and awareness on this topic. 
And so I hope that you were able to learn something new and can apply it to real life situations. And the next speaker will be Kristen Jackson talking about racism and colorism. So racism is a systematic discrimination of people of color and colorism is discrimination against um, someone who has darker skin. So this originated um, in slavery when um, slaves were separated by skin color to make them, well, those who had a lighter skin color um, work in the household because they were seen as more valuable. And obviously this has been abolished, but it does not mean that um, a traces of this bias still doesn't exist in society. So racism and colorism encourage division. And my experience with colorism is I've had family members tell me not to go outside because they don't want me to get any darker than I already am. And they're withholding me from just being a kid and having fun. So that has an impact on mental health because I wasn't able to go after the sports I wanted to. And I've also had friends who have told me that other friends of theirs have said that people walking on, on a street who have a darker skin, they feel uncomfortable and that bias is not right at all. And it just has no place in the, today's society. So the effect on, uh, well, COVID-19's effect on this was that um, people of color in the UK were four times more likely to die of COVID than um, white people because of discrimination. And the, the general trend is that people of color have a harder time um, getting access to healthcare. And when they do, there are situations and cases where um, they're not being provided the right help that they need. For example, in America, black women are um, two times as more likely to die in childbirth than white women because doctors don't take into account their pain or they don't realize that it's as serious because there's a stereotype that they can take more pain, which is not true. So Caymanians were hit hard during our lockdown, lockdown and we had to identify many of these, many of these issues and um, racial divisions. So solutions to these problems going forward is unconscious bias training in schools and teaching the full truth in schools. So that includes making sure that we teach our young people all history, the good and the bad, so that the truth is in the public. And having honest and active reflections and discussions, not just in schools, but in the workplace, as well as government is so important um, in terms of moving forward. So the next speaker will be Dylan DaCosta and he will be talking about income and wage disparities. Thank you. All right. So on Cayman and ongoing issues, income disparity, meaning the dis dispersion of wealth among uh, Caymanians along with their districts. And so for this issue, for this issue I kind of just want to discuss the gap in the income treatment and accessibility found on Cayman. And for my story, I'd like to talk about a family friend who was forced to go towards alcohol and drugs to deal with mental uh, mental health issues caused by his income and something that I researched called the poverty cycle, meaning that someone born in a low income family continues the cycle of poverty and finds struggle to get out of that situation. And from this, I'd like to introduce a um, global statistic saying that children in the lowest income bracket are 4.5 times more likely to experience severe mental health, meaning that there is a direct correlation with the youth in lower income brackets along with their mental health, suicide rates, uh, et cetera. And especially on island and being in Grand Cayman, a tight knit community of 65,000 people, it is quite hard to come up in the in the poverty cycle or out of the poverty cycle, especially because 
the lack of accessibility for lower income families, the lack of higher income jobs, housing, it, Cayman is continuously developing. And so from there, we see an increase in housing prices, um, which can only be paid from minimum wage jobs in lower income families. And so this can be prevalent in families where there is one individual that is acquiring money for the family. So this leads to the father or mother not seeing their children, the wife or husband not are being forced to take care of their children 24 seven, along with children not seeing their parents leading to more, more anguish or mental health issues. And so for this, for a solution I would like to see is company-based scholarships, meaning more community involvement to make it so there's equal opportunity in Cayman and across the Caribbean. And so from this, I would like to introduce a income bracket quota, meaning that from the higher income class, this amount of people will be allowed uh, company-based scholarships towards higher education, middle income, and lower income families will also receive the same opportunity. Along with accessibility to medical resources and therapy, I would like to see insurance coverage for therapy as it is a very expensive accommodation found on Cayman. And so insurance companies covering this will significantly allow for more people to be able to access these resources. And so just to summarize um, quickly, very um, briefly, that master's program, the whole point is to create inclusions and across private and public schools. And since we cover a, a variety of topics, we have all these different perspectives. And the importance of it is that we are shaping our future together with local le leaders and organizations. So we would implore you to create similar programs on your islands to have youth and empower them not only, but also reach out to leaders and create a platform to enact change. Thank you so much for having us here today. Okay, thank you so much, um, Ms. Jackson and um, your team from the Cayman Islands, the Caymanian Youth, um, for sharing with us uh, today at the youth session. Um, and we've come to the end of this youth session. We are a bit over time, but that's, that's, that's okay. Um, so thank you also to Clive from Sidima for sharing with us and to you, the panelists and the audience um, for tuning in to the youth session. We look forward to continued dialogue for sure. And um, we sincerely thank you and everyone for coming on today. And now we will go on to the good practices, good practices session. So thanks. Um, let me also recognize the presence of the Minister of Youth um, for Education, Culture and Sports, with Dr. Rudolph Samuel, who is from St. Martin. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence today. We really appreciate it. And we know that for sure, as long as we have somebody of um, such position that our words and contributions today did not fall on deaf ears. So thank you so much for gracing us with your presence and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. I am now handing over to Cry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Anel. And thank you very much everyone um, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, great. Um, I would like to extend a warm, warm welcome to persons who stayed on from the youth session and those joining us at this time. This is the second segment in the series where we highlight cases from throughout the region that support education continuity, youth agency, and advocacy despite the threat of events such as COVID-19 and other hazards. The regional review 
on school safety in the context of systemic risk, the Virtual Caribbean Safe School Initiative pre-ministerial forum is considered a timely event. It is expected to capture and synthesize the plethora of dialogues on education sector response to the COVID-19 pandemic that have already taken place through multiple partners and the range of responses that the ministries of education and other partners would have implemented by the end of the 2020 hurricane season. Through the virtual uh, CSSI pre-ministerial forum, high-level delegates will define the project, the topics to be discussed at the third Caribbean Safe School Ministerial Forum, and that will aim to build education sector resilience in the Caribbean region. During these segments, we hope that the good practices shared will be of relevance and interest to you in your nation. While we will not be conducting any question and answer during this segment, please contact the respective presenters if you should require further details. Their email addresses can be found in the session details of this event's website. So today we have two presentations, one from the, uh, from the Bahamas on disaster preparedness, children as advocates, and the other from the Cayman Islands on recovery, resilience, and mental health promotion, embedded social and emotional literacy programs in schools. Now these two presentations promise to be very exciting, so um, I hope you will stick around to uh, listen to our pre presenters. Let me first uh, introduce um, Ms. Dominique McCartney Russell, who will present on disaster preparedness, children as advocates. Ms. Russell uh, is a district super superintendent in Abaco, Ministry of Education of the Bahamas. And she's presenting the good practice on behalf of the Department of Education, the Bahamas. Um, Ms. Russell has been an educator for 26 years. She serves as district superintendent in the Bahamas Ministry of Education with specific oversight for the island of Abaco and the surrounding Keys. She has a master's degree in organizational learning and leadership. She has served as an examinations team leader with the evaluation and assessment division of the Ministry of Education and is also a former teacher trainee supervisor at the University of the Bahamas. Ms. McCartney-Russell, Ms. McCartney I now invite you to make your presentation, <laughs> sorry. Okay, let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay, I think I better do that again. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I would first like to provide some context. My topic is disaster preparedness, children as advocates. The Bahamas is an archipelagic nation with more than 700 islands and keys. We have 16 major tourist destinations. I am presently in Abaco as indicated by that arrow. Before Hurricane Dorian landed in Abaco, there were more than 3,400 students enrolled in both the 14 government maintained and eight private schools. Our rapid damage assessment after the hurricane passed revealed that there was less than 600 children remaining due to the evacuation exercise. Hurricane Dorian made landfall in Abaco September 1st, 2019 impact winds of 185 miles per hour, and it is one of the worst storms we have experienced. All schools experienced or sustained damages, but 10 schools sustained major property damage as indicated by the red. Now, due to the environment in central Abaco at the time, people were asked to evacuate the area. Some families went to stay with their family members, but a vast majority were evacuated to other islands. A post-disaster education sector assessment was conducted through the collaboration between USAID, the Bahamas Ministry of Education and UNICEF. And based on that intense qualitative analysis, we thought that there should be great emphasis placed on family preparedness. 
we wanted children to be less traumatized by the occurrence of disasters. And we thought that one of the best ways that that could happen is to involve our children in the preparation. Now the students at Crossing Rocks Primary were enrolled in the pilot program last year. And the goal was to have children serve as advocates through the involvement in production of family emergency plans, family communication plans, and family emergency kits. Hey, hey now, sorry, Ms. Russell, can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm sorry, we're ha having a little difficulty with your, your presentation um, on screen. It's a bit blur, so we're gonna ask uh, Marcel to facilitate the sharing. Um, so, so okay. sorry for, okay. yes, yes, thanks. So you want me to stop sharing? Okay. Yes, thank you, all righty. Okay, can we go then to slide seven? Okay, go back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the less prepared families are for natural disaster, the longer it takes to support the continuity of education. You know, people will tell you that they know what to do in a disaster, but we believe that it is an espoused response and not necessarily reality because many families did not have emergency plans or communication plans. They, did, they were not prepared um, or they had not prepared disaster supplies or participated in any family disaster simulation exercise. And so as education practitioners, how do we ensure the continuity of educational opportunities for children during a hurricane or other natural disaster? How do we ensure that our children become more resilient? We involve them in process. We think children make great advocates for their families and there are several benefits to self-advocacy. For example, children are resilient, they recover quickly from difficulties and having children assist their families in the preparation and implementation of plans allows for the discovery of gaps and the provision of solutions. Every home environment is different and having simulation exercises makes the planning process that much stronger and more reliable. I think that's the next slide. And self-advocacy builds confidence. Knowing what to do makes the next step easier. Self-advocacy grows competence. Students who practice how they will communicate, where they will go or what they will do allows them to test what they really know. And it also reduces confusion and uncertainty and helps our children take ownership for their learning. Do we have the next slide since I'm not sharing? Okay, now the initiative calls for students at Crossing Rocks Primary to create family communication plans. You can click through this because this is going to show the, the actual plan. Now, this is not a novel idea because you can find communication plans online. We place the emphasis on the production of the artifacts we should be able at the end of this program to ask any family in Abaco to pull out their family communication plans. And they will be able to. We want to know that learning took place. We want to move from policy to practice. And we believe that the creation of plans is evidence for learning. And so the plan must include, and for the students at Crossing Rocks, it did include an emergency contact on island and one off island. Students had to prepare with their parents where they will meet, well, indoors, outdoors, um, in their neighborhood, out of their neighborhood, and of course, off island. We also asked our children to plan with their family. You can stop there. To plan with their family, their uh, plans related to the school, child care and workplace. For example, what's the name of the child's school, the address, any emergency number, 
the website or Facebook information of the school. We also want to know who's going to pick up this child in the case of an emergency. And so this family communication plan is not going to remain in the head of a parent. The, the child along with their family discuss this plan and put this actually in writing and then they have to present that to their teacher for review. So we have now moved from them saying they know what to do to actually proving that they know what to do. And then the next thing we asked students to do was to create an emergency plan. And this emergency plan, really you can have an emergency plan per disaster. But for our environment, because we are in the hurricane belt, we asked our children to assist their parents and their family members in the home to create their emergency plan, thinking about a hurricane in mind. And so some of the information that we expect our children to have in their emergency plan is, for example, escape routes. We are at least two anyway. Emergency numbers safe places inside. The older children should know how to turn off water or gas valves, how to turn off electrical panels in a disaster. They should know where the fire extinguisher is and how to use it. They should know where the, uh, the emergency kit is, where the disaster kit is. And of course, they should be able to connect with their family on a, a consistent basis to go over their emergency plan. And so you will see on the screen, if, if you would keep scrolling it, this is a copy of an emergency plan for family. This was given to the students who participated in the program at Crossing Rocks so that they could plan with their family how they would communicate, how they would move or escape during a disaster. It's scrolling slowly, but we're getting there. <laughs> and so some very important information on this family emergency plan. Now, thirdly, if we move to the next slide, we also asked the children to assist in the preparation of the basic emergency supply kit. And I would venture to say that there are some persons who are participating in this uh, session now who may be in the hurricane belt, who may not have this. And so we ask our children to be advocates for their families by assisting their families with the, the creation of this kit. And the evidence of learning for us or the assessment was students had to take a picture. They had to show themselves with their family member and the items of this kit. And that showed us that they actually had an emergency kit. Next slide. And the most important aspect of this, what we consider a good practice, is practice, practice, practice. Because repetition, we believe, is a teacher's best friend. And so we believe that the practice would reinforce learning. It would identify any gaps and allow for solutions. And of course, it would promote confidence. And so we asked our children again with their families to meet and discuss their plans, as well as to practice using simulation exercises or drills with different scenarios on how they would escape. And so we asked for them to produce their videos to show this. And of course, the teacher would review that. And this, in our estimation, was moving from policy to practice. Our children would be able to create their, the environment that would allow them to be more powerful. And so the next slide, I want to show Mrs. Bernal Higgs. I'm not sure that that will show since we're having uh, problems with this slide, with this presentation. And if we can't show Ms. Higgs, I will just move to Elisa. You know, students were invited to present their plans for the teacher review. And so, uh, so let it go then. Let us play.
Okay, so as you saw, our students were invited to present their plans to the teacher, Mrs. Brunel Higgs, who's also the principal of the school. And they also had to show pictures of their kids. They were also asked to have meetings with their families and participate, like I said, in family drills or a simulation exercise using a variety of scenarios. And we uh, invited them to produce the video. Uh, Lisa is shown, was shown here, um, performing a simulation exercise with her mother. And then of course you see her showing her emergency kit. And so now Lisa is an advocate because she is ensuring with the help of a teacher that her family is better prepared. At the end of the day in Abaco, we want to move from policy to practice. We want our children to be more resilient, more powerful, and certainly better prepared. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Ms. Russell, for sharing with us such an excited and practical approach on how children can be advocates for disaster preparedness. And uh, we also want to echo your message on the importance of developing family disaster plans and uh, practicing or exercising these plans, especially as we um, head into the hurricane season. So thank you so very much for sharing on that. Um, I remind our audience that of course, you can always um, submit your questions to our, our presenters. Um, the information is on the events web event website. So you can always post your question there. We'll share them with the presenter. All right, uh, I will move straight into the next presentation. Uh, recovery, resilience, and mental health promotion through embedded social and emotional literacy programs in schools. And this will be presented by Dr. C Catherine Day. Uh, Dr. Catherine Day is a highly specialist consultant clinical psychologist with over 20 years of clinical experience, including eight years in the Cayman Islands. She is a British psychological Psychological Society Chartered Psychologist, Registered Expert Witness, and a member of the Institute of Psychotherapy and Disability. Registered with the Cayman Islands uh, Health Practice Commission and the UK Healthcare Professionals Council. Uh, Dr. Day, I now invite you to make your presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Um, today I'm going to tell you about the Alex Panton Foundation's Social and Emotional Literacy Program, which in collaboration with the Ministry and Department of Education, we have rolled out in our primary schools as part of the pandemic school recovery. Let me just share my screen. There we go. Okay. So pandemic school recovery must involve um, re restoring emotional well-being before academic losses can be addressed. Mm -hmm. Children have multiple effects of stress due to the pandemic. Um, and we know that the brain that is stuck in stress, threat or trauma response cannot learn because the cortex is offline. Children have experienced multiple losses and there are many consequences of this. The loss of human interaction during lockdown is um, and ongoing is not to be underestimated. The absence of face-to-face -face contact with teachers and peers, family overseas, the loss of a teacher, friend or nanny who had to leave Ireland, loss of routine and structure can be devastating for children. They need to know what is happening, what they're doing now and next. And without this, they become anxious and lack focus. As we settle into this new normal, some aspects may be forever changed in some families. The loss of a job, working from home, change of caregivers. Loss of friendship, opportunities and freedom. What teen wanted to be locked down with their parents? And how did young children cope with not being able to go out and play with their neighbors? Exams were missed and school placements were affected. So loss generates four main consequences. And these are powerful forces, particularly when they are unpredictable, uncontrollable, and prolonged. Some children may have become young carers during this time for parents who may be immunocompromised. Some may have become anxious about social engagement, a process which is fundamental to our well being, and developed fears about contracting the virus. Some may have had earlier separations re triggered and felt a sense of abandonment. 
For some, school may have been their safe, dependable space, and now that is no longer certain or to be relied upon. Some may be worried about loss of learning or struggle to have got back to it. And all around us is news of death and sickness, and many of us will have been bereaved recently, whether due to COVID or other causes. And we most likely have lost the opportunity to engage in the usual social rituals around death. Many of us are worried about how long this situation will last. And all of this affects our children, whether directly or indirectly, through the stress of their parents, teachers and caregivers. So the way we go about recovery from and managing ongoing stress is not to go straight to the catching up of academic lost time. We need to approach it from the way that we know the brain heals from stress and trauma, bottom up. As families, communities and organisations, we can use these five levers to guide us to the restoration of well-being. An embedded social and emotional literacy programme focuses particularly on the importance of relationships and community recovery. In 2019-2020 academic year, the Alex Panton Foundation was piloting the Partnership for Children's Skills for Life programmes in a small selection of schools and collecting data on social, emotional and behavioural functioning of the children receiving the programme. Our initial data, which was up to March 2020 when schools shut for lockdown, showed a statistically significant improvement in 39% of the measures surveyed and only half of the programme had been delivered by that point. After COVID hit, we collaborated with the Ministry and Department of Education to develop a national rollout. We developed a self-sustaining system where our initial master trainers were trained in the programme by Partnership for Children. And then our own local master trainers trained teachers and additional master trainers, and we can continue to do so on demand. We now have 21 participating schools and have trained over 200 teachers and 30 master trainers and reached over 3000 children in our islands, all in a very short space of time. Our teacher trainings have moved from in-person to online, and we've seen how quickly this can become a national program, even in areas where lockdown is in place. Some of our schools were even able to continue the program during online schooling. The benefits of social and emotional literacy have been well researched. There were meta-analysis of hundreds of studies in 2011 and 2017 involving school-based programs, including over 270,000 students right from kindergarten up to high school. And there were multiple benefits, not least of which was an 11 percentile point improvement in academic performance in children who received these programs. And the benefits were found in follow-up studies to have lasted for months and even years. Hence, we call it the skills for life. Our own data collection is ongoing and in collaboration with other nonprofits such as the Red Cross and government agencies, we are comparing the mental well-being of children prior to and post pandemic. So let me tell you about the social and emotional literacy program that we use. Zippy and Apple's Friends is an evidence-based mental health promotion program for five to nine year olds designed to be delivered easily within the school curriculum or after care programs. They have inclusion supplements for children with additional needs and the Zippy's Friends Special Educational Need and Disability or SEND program can be used for young people throughout primary and secondary education. The programs were developed by International Charity Partnership for Children who work in partnership with over 32 countries around the world and have an evidence base from five randomized control trials which speak to its effectiveness in different cultural communities. Cayman is the first partner in the world to have implemented both the mainstream and the SEND program from the beginning, and only the fourth country in the world to deliver the SEND program at all. We are very proud of our vision for inclusive mental health promotion for all of our children, regardless of ability or need. The programs are story based and follow a group of children and their pet Zippy or Apple as they deal with common childhood situations. Each session, there is a story with activities. All the resources are provided with ready-made lesson plans, activities, and worksheets. The programs cover six basic areas of social and emotional literacy, usually taught in 40 minute sessions over 24 weeks or longer if SCND. Module one is identifying and recognizing basic emotions. Module two is communicating our feelings to others and asking for help. 
Module three is around friendship skills. Module four, dealing with conflict and bullying. Module five covers change and loss, such as moving schools, separation, divorce, and bereavements, very apt today. And module six is a summary of all the modules and the coping skills learnt. They can be taught as standalone sessions or embedded into other classes. Each module has four lessons with a detailed lesson plan. Children are encouraged to come up with their own solutions to social and emotional problems using the basic rules for choosing a solution. So even young children can learn how to identify and access helpful coping strategies without the need for adult intervention and without teaching right or wrong strategies, since for each individual and each situation, there will be a different solution. Very fitting for current times when each and every one of us has been affected by the pandemic in different ways. And so we knew that when we were hit by one of the biggest challenges to our social, emotional and physical well-being that the world has seen in many years, Zippy and Apple were just right to be part of our recovery plan. I would like to share with you um, some words from one of our teachers from the pilot phase. Give me one second. regulate their emotions. It's amazing. So I work with the other MLD students, so they're all teenagers going through lots of hormonal changes, things they don't really understand. Uh, so the Zippy program has really helped them to manage their feelings and manage their emotions, just identify different coping strategies. So we had lots of kind of low level behaviours in class and some quite big outbursts from before the Zippy program started. And even during the period of time off with COVID and coming back, the students have still managed to identify those coping strategies and the low-level behaviours have completely decreased. The big explosive behaviours pretty much gone. Um, so they're, they're really identifying the strategies they need to help them manage their anger and their communication and things too. Yeah. Of course, parent involvement is crucial. So activities are sent home at the end of each module for parents to complete with their child. We could not have done it without the generosity of our sponsors and all of our volunteer master trainers. These skills really are for life and social emotional literacy underlines our successful pandemic recovery and long term functioning. I will leave you with Deja's description of Zippy's friends and comments from our kids and teachers. Miss Dina always come in here. She's always talking about Zippy. She makes us write that what I love about. And she tells a story about Zippy, about Dig, Sandy, and Leia later. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Day, for your informative and uh, insightful presentation on the, on the importance of social and emotional programs to aid in the recovery and resilience building for children, especially during times of crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, we cannot underscore, actually, you know, enough the significance of providing psychosocial support and coping strategies for children. So thank you very much for, for sharing that. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of this Good Practices session. I uh, wish to thank again our presenters, uh, Ms. McCartney Russell and Dr. D. Thank you both for sharing on those good practices from your respective countries. Thanks also to you, our audience, for joining us and sticking with us this afternoon. And I certainly hope you found the session valuable. Uh, please consider attending the other Good Practices session which is um, coming up shortly. Practitioner's Showcase um, should be starting at 1.30 p.m. today. Uh, so just use the link tinyurl.com slash CSSI2021 to join. I think that's posted in the chat. So you can just uh, click on that or copy that link and join the upcoming uh, Good Practices session. Please note that the next Good Practices segment is not to be confused with the technical session five um, practitioner, practitioner session, which will begin at 3 p.m. today, all right? Good Practices session will start at 1.30, but the technical session, technical session five, 
will begin at 3 p.m. All right, so thank you all very much again and have a wonderful afternoon and please keep safe.